Hyderabad, we have some very good news for everyone. The New York Times bestseller, Inner Engineering, A Yogi's Guide to Joy, will now be available in Telugu. In this book, for the first time, Sadhguru presented readers with a path to achieving absolute well-being through the classical science of yoga in a practical, accessible book. Sadhguru tells the story of his own awakening from a boy with an affinity for the natural world to, the, to a young daredevil who crossed the Indian subcontinent on his motorcycle. The wisdom distilled in this accessible, profound and engaging book offers the readers opportunity to achieve nothing less than a life of joy. It has sold over 3 lakh copies in English so far and been translated over 20 languages in India and abroad. We are happy to announce that the book is now available in Telugu, published by MSCO Books Hyderabad. To launch this book, we request Nani to please come on the dais. Take this opportunity to thank Sri Chandrasekhar Edigaru, Chief Editor, MS Co Books, and volunteers who helped translate the book. We extend our heartfelt gratitude to Sri Vijay Kumar Garu, Chairman, MS Co Books, for publishing this book. Thank you, Nani. Now, to the much awaited part of the event that we are all looking forward. I request Sadhguru to please come on the dais. ఎందుకంటే <laughs> 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 సో ముందే చెప్పేస్తున్నా అయినా సరే నేను ఇంగ్లీష్లో అడగడానికి ట్రై చేస్తాను అది ఏమైనా మీకు బట్లర్ ఇంగ్లీష్ అనిపిస్తే ట్రాల్స్ చేశారంటే మర్యాదగా ఉండదు చెప్తున్నా ఓకే కదా సద్గురు వచ్చేటప్పుడు ఆయనతో పాటు తిరిగి కార్లో వచ్చేటప్పుడు వాట్ ఈస్ ఈక్వల్ అండ్ ఫర్ బట్లర్ ఇంగ్లీష్ వన్ టీ వన్ తెలుగు బట్ అంతే అలాంటిది సద్గురు కూడా తెలుగు వచ్చు సో కొంచెం ధైర్యంగా అప్పుడప్పుడు తెలుగు మాట్లాడేయచ్చు నేను 
వచ్చేటప్పుడు కారులో సద్గురు అడిగారు సో ఇప్పుడు స్టేడియంలో వచ్చే మీ ఫ్యాన్స్ జనరల్గా ఏజ్ గ్రూప్ ఉంటారు అని అడిగారు సార్ ఇప్పుడు వచ్చే ఫ్యాన్స్ ఎవరు నా ఫ్యాన్స్ కాదు మీ ఫ్యాన్స్ అండ్ ఇది అన్ని ఏజ్ గ్రూప్లు ఉంటారు అని చెప్పాను సో సార్ ఫస్ట్ టైం చాలా ఇవేండి క్వశ్చన్ కాపీ చేస్తారు అని అదే చెప్దాం అనుకున్నాను ఎందుకంటే ఫస్ట్ టైం లైఫ్లో అంటే చాలా చాలా స్పెషల్గా అనిపిస్తుంది ఈరోజు ఎందుకంటే లైఫ్ లాంగ్ టీచర్స్ అడిగిన ఒక్క ఆన్సర్ కూడా క్వశ్చన్ ఒక్క ఒక్క క్వశ్చన్ కూడా ఆన్సర్ చెప్పాను నేను ఈరోజు అన్ని ఆన్సర్లు ఉన్న వ్యక్తిని క్వశ్చన్స్ అడుగుతున్నాను అండ్ మీరు అన్నట్టు ఈరోజు మధ్యాహ్నం క్వశ్చన్స్ రాసుకుంటుంటే నేను నాకు చాలా నాస్టాలజిక్గా అనిపించింది ఎందుకంటే ఎగ్జామ్ స్కూల్లో ఆన్సర్ షీట్లో కూడా క్వశ్చన్ పేపర్ రాసేవాడి ఆన్సర్ తెలియక సో ఇంకా మొదలు పెట్టేస్తాను చాలా చాలా టైం పాస్ చేశాను అసలు అసలు మ్యాటర్ ఆయన ఆయన మాట్లాడితే వినాలని వచ్చారు మేము అందరూ సో సార్ ముందు వెన్ ఐ అసిస్టెంట్ డైరెక్టర్ వీ యూస్ టు grow beard sir because people will take us seriously i did not grow it it grows <laughs> i mean to say we never used to shave because uh, whenever we went to a hero or a producer and narrated stories we thought they will they will take us seriously they will believe us so i i saw in one video where you are saying uh, we should let it grow it's natural and all that is this angle also involved in it or it's just that నేచర్ డి నాట్ గివ్ ఎనీథింగ్ ఫర్ యూ విచ్ ఈస్ అన్నెసెసరీ ఇట్స్ ఆల్ పార్ట్ ఆఫ్ ద ఎవల్యూషన్ సో సమ్ పీపుల్ హ్యావ్ రిమూవ్ సమ్ హెయిర్ సమ్ పీపుల్ హ్యావ్ సాక్రిఫైస్ దేర్ బ్రెయిన్స్ సమ్ పీపుల్ అవుట్ ఆఫ్ దేర్ లవ్ ఫర్ సమ్బడి దేవ్ గివెన్ అవర్ కిడ్నీ I thought I will be more useful to the world if I keep everything as it is. Are you going to cut the nails? Are you going to bring it here? No, that also would not have been necessary if we lived in the jungle. It would have been useful and it would have gone over, worn out by use. Today because lifestyles have become such that you don't use your hands so much. So maybe you will have to cut it. I just rub it on the rock usually. <laughs> those of you who don't have nail cutters like me you don't have to bite it if you just sit somewhere and do this so this uh, this uh, question has been bothering me from a long time see most of the questions today i'm going to ask are not the ones i've asked on twitter or anywhere to ask questions i'll ask sir guru or i'm not forwarding it here i'm just asking whatever i have a doubt so it might you might find it very basic dumb or whatever but those are my questions so i am asking them so this has been bothering me from a long time when i was an assistant director i remember my first salary when they gave it to me it was 4000 rupees and then i remember it was all 100 rupees notes so when i put it in my pocket there was a bump on my bump so when i was going back on the bike i could feel it and i was feeling that i'm so rich there's so much cash in my pocket and i was re- I, i can remember how excited i was how i wanted to buy a half of the hyderabad with that 4000 bucks <laughs> so i was i was really really happy and uh, i don't remember that kind of happiness you know happening to me again now i'm earning thousands of times of that but i i don't remember what you know having that same feeling again even saturday night we used to with my friends i used to go to the sony daba or quarter <laughs> okay from monday to friday i used to wait for saturday on the saturday morning i used to be so excited that it's saturday again evening we are all going to catch up meet and then going to sony daba so i was really happy and then i never really i i, I made it i was successful in cinema i never imagined that i will you know made it make it so far 
but i never experienced that kind of happiness so is success overrated like we all we all are waiting for success we all think that some day we want to be success but it, the idea of success is it is it not overrated is what i want to ask oh. so all those who clap we know they are failures <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, they're all the Daba people. Yeah. <clears throat> so when you understand a means as an end, then this will happen. Money is just a means to do whatever we wish to do. The reason why everybody keeps a certain amount of money is so that tomorrow morning I don't have to worry, where's my breakfast? So that survival is taken care of, so that I can put myself into what I value most. Otherwise, every day morning I'll have to go in search of food. So, money is just about that. It is a means to organize a few things. A whole lot of people everywhere, particularly in Hyderabad, they are going at it as if money is their goal. Money is not your goal, it's just a means. So in your life, for the span of life that you have and the intelligence that you have and the capability that you have, how much means do you need is something you must gauge. Otherwise, you'll have means and you'll not… you'll not have any goal. What is the use of a means? but there is no goal. You have a car, but you don't know where to go. What is the point? You know where to go. If you get on the bus, you will go there in six hours. If you get into your car, you will go there in two hours. That's why you have a car, because you know where you want to go. Now you don't know where you want to go, but you have a rocket. What is the point? And anyway, if you bought half of Hyderabad, I want you to understand, the real fun is in the other half always. <laughs> you have heard of Alexander the Great. You have heard of Alexander the Great? <clears throat> the moment you make an idiot like that, great, then your life is ruined. Because I want you to understand what this man did. Alexander started off on his conquest mode at the age of sixteen. He went from country to country killing hundreds of thousands, thousands of people, killing, saying, this is my land, but won't sit there and enjoy that land, we'll go to the next one because the other part of the Hyderabad he's looking. <laughs> like this he came all the way to India or to the entry of Indian subcontinent. By then he's thirty-two, he's tired, killing, fighting, fighting, killing endlessly. He killed many of his very close friends who started off with him because they all wanted to go back. Sixteen years, no cell phone, you can't talk to your family. They have left their land sixteen years ago, at the age of sixteen, seventeen. They are fighting endlessly, killing blood, 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 all, that's all they have seen. Everybody's tired. But this man wants the other part of Hyderabad. So, he went through a certain <clears throat> experience. Now, time is running out. For a warrior, thirty-two is not a good age. Things are becoming a little weaker, you know, not as good as it was at twenty-five. So, he is worried. So one thing is, he wants to conquer the world and it's taking too much time. So he wanted to become immortal. This is the next. Once you have Hyderabad, next is immortality. So he wants to become immortal. 
So he heard lots of stories, Indian yogis, mystics who lived for thousands of years, you know, India is full of such stories. So he sent out an advance party of one eight soldiers, go find an Indian yogi who will teach me the science of immortality. So they came looking around and then they found one yogi, somewhere probably looking at the descriptions. We think somewhere in the, let's say, in the Pakistani Punjab, that region somewhere, looking at the description of terrain, everything, it seems like that, we could be wrong, but somewhere in that region, what is pre presently Pakistan, which was considered India at that time. So he came and uh, they came and they found a yogi sitting under a tree, just one loincloth simply sitting there under a tree, blissed out. They looked at him and they said, that you come, our Alexander wants to meet you. The yogi laughed and said, I'm not going anywhere, I'm here. If he wants, please ask him to come. They said, no, you better come, he is the emperor, you just come now. He said, no. They pulled out their swords. These are uh, violent men. They can take off your life for nothing. Now he has given a good cause that he is refusing their orders. So they said, we'll take off your head. He laughed and said, take it off. I've finished everything that I need to do with myself. I'm just sitting here, enjoying the, my existence. You want to take my head, take it. See, if I take your head, I will not get your intelligence. This is one thing people must understand. <laughs> if I could get your intelligence, I could take all your heads and keep it with me. But no, if I take your head, I will not get anything from you. Only thing is, I'll have a, a piece of meat to handle. <laughs> so when… then they thought, oh, this guy is not scared of death, he must be mortal. They said, begged him, please come, our emperor wants to know about immortality. The yogi laughed, let him come here <laughs> Then they went back and said, I think we have met a man who is immortal because we pulled out our swords, that guy is not scared, obviously he must be mortal. Then he himself came. When he came, uh, Alexander sat on his horse. You know, emperors wear the most stupid clothing. You know, how every day same clothing and a metal crown is the most uncomfortable headgear to wear. At least this is nice, you know, this comforts you. Crown is a terrible thing to wear, just wear one metal strap around your head for two days and see how it feels to be a king. <laughs> so he tried to talk to him, he said, you, I want to know immortality. The yogi said, get off that stupid horse. Because have you seen always when somebody sits on a horse, they become like this? You sit on an animal which is less intelligent than you, and suddenly you feel so big. <laughs> so he said, you get off that stupid horse first. So he got off, then he asked about immortality. The yogi tried to tell him, see, this is not the way to go. If you want, I will teach you how to turn inward, we will see. He said, no, no, I want immortality. After much conversation when it did not get anywhere, the yogi said, okay, you go in this direction. He gave the landmarks how to get there, a long journey, about five-day journey. There, there is one cave. In that cave, there is a, a bowl of water in a stone, uh, you know, on the stone floor, there is a certain amount of water. You just drink a handful of that water, you will become immortal. Immediately, Alexander set forth. After three days, him and his eight soldiers going, then he thought, if these eight guys also become immortal, you ca see, the power is in killing them. His power is, I can kill you any moment I want. Suppose you become immortal, I can't kill you, then how do I manage you? So he said, you guys stay here. The last part of the journey, I want to do it myself. So he left them there and alone he went, found the cave. 
Then he found that water as he was told. He went and put his hands and was about to drink. Then a voice spoke and said, Don't drink that water, I drank that and look at my state. He looked around, who is talking? There was nobody around, by then the water slipped out. Then he saw a crow and the crow said, Don't drink that water. I drank that water, I don't know when. And now the problem is I cannot die. See, if we really want to punish you, death sentence is not such a bad thing. If we curse you that you can never die, a million years later you're still sitting here, this is the worst punishment <laughs> So, Alexander did one sensible thing, he did not drink that water, otherwise we had to suffer him even today <laughs> So this is the only sensible thing he did in his life, he did not drink that water because he realized that he will not a be able to bear himself. Forget about the world. The world will suffer of course, but he himself cannot stand himself beyond a certain point. So we must understand, this life is not a conquest. This is not a conquest. The only thing that's there for you in this life is the profoundness of your experience. How profound is your experience when you sit here? This is all there is, nothing else you carry. Other arrangements we make for convenience. How much convenience do, do you want? Convenience will work only to a certain point. It will never transform itself into well-being. People have invested and invested like this endlessly. I met somebody, you know, I was in a home in the United States. And I walked into this room and I found seven hundred to eight hundred pairs of footwear. And this lady of the house came in and she saw I was in this room, she said, Sadhguru, Sadhguru, why are you here? I said, what is this footwear? She said, no Sadhguru, let's go, what do you want Sadhguru? I said, whose footwear? Then I see it's all ladies, it's all your footwear, eight hundred pairs. I can understand. Uh, you want one shoes for walking, another for jogging, another for golf, another for office, another for party. Well, you are a woman, you want all the seven colors of the rainbow. Uh, all right, you have twenty-five, you have thirty, it's okay with me. Eight hundred. How will you wear on these two feet? You're not a centipede. I said, how many lifetimes are you planning to come back and walk? <laughs> the day you met me, I thought, we will make this the last one for you. But now you, you've got shoes for many lifetimes ready. It'll all go waste if you don't come back. Then this was bothering me. And I met a, a CEO of a, a very large shoemaking company in America. Then I asked him, why would a woman buy eight hundred pairs of shoes? He said, Sadhguru, that is the only thing she can buy the same size throughout her life <laughs> Then I thought it's okay, maybe <laughs> But the fun is in the other half. So basically, uh, the Nardna, that I have become more wise, that I am unable to enjoy. <laughs> See, you cannot enjoy anything, this must be understood. Mm. If you try to enjoy something, you will bring misery upon yourself. But if you are joyful, everything is nice. You are supposed to be joyful, you are not supposed to enjoy. What is that enjoy? I know. <laughs> when there is no joy, you try to enjoy. It is just that if you add one more alphabet, no, no, if, if you add one more alphabet, it'll become end joy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I meant joyful only, but uh, I, uh, I never again felt that kind of a high, that without thinking anything to be completely joyful. So yeah. if joy is what you're looking for, 
This will not come because of a bulge in your pocket. Joy means your life energy is in a certain state of exuberance. You're not dead. Mostly people are committing suicide in installments. Slowly they're becoming like this. All these people, if you saw them when they were five years of age, they were like this. Slowly. Grave faces. Grave faces because I think many of them are practicing the last pose in their life. I… you're an actor, you can tell them <laughs> You don't have to practice, believe me, you… when it comes to death, you're a natural star. <laughs> have you… have you… <laughs> I know <laughs> Have you ever seen any dead body? which is having a wrong expression on its face. <laughs> no. So why are you practicing now? Life has many expressions that will happen if you are in a certain exuberance of life. If you are slowly killing yourself, yes, literally killing yourself, so slowly it is becoming like half dead. I want you to understand this. Fully alive is fantastic. Dead is good, at least for others. <laughs> but half alive means it's torture. See, if I want to keep you, if I want to torture you, what will I do? Will I kill you? I will keep you half alive. That is torture, isn't it? So if you keep yourself half alive, this is torture. Everybody… every day waking up in the morning itself is torture for a whole lot of people. Only little joy when that Sony Daba <laughs> Like in America they have a culture, thank God it's Friday. Thank God it's Friday. So if five days of the week is misery, how come Friday becomes joy? No, chemically induced something. This is the greatest danger in human life. Today we are going towards this very rapidly. To be healthful, we need chemicals. To be peaceful, we need chemicals. To be joyful, we need chemicals. To be blissful, we need chemicals. For ecstasy, you have ecstasy. For everything you need chemicals. Once this happens, right now, I think it has happened approximately to twenty-five to thirty percent of the population on the planet. The day it happens to eighty to ninety percent of the planet, that everybody is on some kind of chemical to experience something, then the next generation that you produce will be much lesser than you. Once we produce a generation which is less than us, we have committed a crime against humanity. The next generation should at least be one step ahead of us. If we leave them behind us, this is a crime against humanity. We are trying to get there rapidly. <laughs> so, I put a particular Malli Alant of a feeling, I put in feel I think during my release time, after working for nine months on a film, when I get to watch that film on screen, I that that three hours is meditation for me. It's the most happiest moment in a year for me. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. So, next question, I can't do it, I can't do it. I am the one who is facing the questions, Naktani Chamatul Potal confident in AV play AV button starting. So, Ah, Next, 
ఇది ఇందులో ఎంతమంది కనెక్ట్ అవుతారో లేదో నాకు తెలియదు సాధారణంగా మన ఇళ్లలో జనరలీ దిస్ డిస్టి ఈజ్ అ వెరీ బిగ్ థింగ్ డిస్టి తెలుసు కదా సో మా అమ్మ చిన్నప్పటి నుంచి జనరల్గా దిష్టి తీయాలి దిష్టి తీయాలి అంటూ ఉండేది అండ్ బయటికి ఎక్కడికి వెళ్ళినా సరే చాలా బాగున్నావు దిష్టి తీయాలి లేదంటే సినిమా చాలా బాగుంది నీకు దిష్టి తీయాలి దిష్టి తగిలిందేమో తర్వాత ఎప్పుడైనా మనకు చిన్న ఏదైనా యాక్సిడెంట్ అయినా ఏమైనా ప్రాబ్లం వచ్చినా చూసావా దిష్టి తగిలింది సో తెలియకుండా ఈ ఐడియాని చాలా ఒక పాపులర్ ఐడియా చేస్తారు మన చుట్టూ ఉండేవారు సో ఐ స్టార్టెడ్ యూనో ఆఫ్టర్ ఇనీషియలీ ఐ యూస్ టు థింక్ దిస్ ఇస్ వన్ చాదస్తాం మై మామ్ జస్ట్ వాంట్స్ టు డూ సండ్ ఓకే డూ ఇట్ అనేవాడిని బట్ లేటర్ లేటర్ వెన్ when i started having this some accident at the shoot or something something it kept on happening and particularly i had this back to back hits and and then i had this back to back accidents also and then without me realizing i started believing it suddenly i i've started reminding my mom amma this trip elthunana so e distane concept రకరకాల మంది రకరకాలుగా చెప్తారు పీపుల్స్ ఏ సమ్ ఎనర్జీ అంటారు ఇంకోటి అంటారు ఇంకోటి అంటారు బట్ ఇట్ ఈస్ అ వెరీ హౌస్ హోల్డ్ థింగ్ ఇట్స్ అ వెరీ పాపులర్ బిలీఫ్ దీని మీద మీ అభిప్రాయం ఏంటి ఇది ఉందా లేదా డైలీ స్నానాలు చేస్తారు no why i'm asking is in chennai they are having bath once in 3 days me inka hyderabad inka akkad poled meeru akkad dagel inka usain sagar lo so yesterday i was speaking with a prominent group of people in the evening one of the government officials said all these rich people are having shower every day i said where do you come from ah? <laughs> in south india without having a shower we won't step out of our home yeah no matter what even if we don't drink we'll shower first <laughs> so don't start this new culture <laughs> have shower once in thank god it's friday <laughs> <laughs> so you have you wash your body with water it's not just about remo- removing the dirt even if you don't have any dirt Have you seen after day's work, if you pick up a lot of stuff, you come and have a shower, oh, it's like a new life has come. Does it happen? Hmm? Not just cleansing the body, it's not the soap, just the water running over your body. You go take a dip in a river, stay there for ten minutes, come out, just see, it feels like you're born again. because you need to understand this body is made of fundamentally five elements of earth water fire air and space this season in our yoga center because we have a wind tunnel in the sense from the silent valley the winds that the monsoon winds that blow gets kind of focused in the valley and when it comes towards the yoga center it will be coming anywhere between 70 to 70 to 110 kilometers per hour different times of the day so at this time all our people are doing sadhana just standing in the wind like this because this is a wind wash water wash you're doing every day wind wash you can do people yogis were always smearing themselves with earth but today that's become mud bath in the spa okay So mud bath is there, Sim- similarly there is a fire wash. This fire wash, we call it klesha nashana kriya. That means a, a, an act which will take away the impurities that gather around you. Because your body is not just here, your body is, doesn't stop here, it extends itself. Have you noticed, probably women are more sensitive to this than men, you don't have to be touched by somebody if somebody comes a bit too close not a psychological thing that's a different matter psychological and emotional aspects are there leaving that if somebody comes too close right there itself there is a feeling that you know you want some distance they haven't touched you just like this this itself causes some disturbance isn't it because the body doesn't end here the energy is little beyond that 
How much beyond that depends on how exuberant your life energies are. If your life, life energies are truly exuberant, you can fill this hall with it. Otherwise, it is at least a little bit. For most human beings, it could be anywhere between three to nine inches outside of their body. So as impurities gather on your body, if you drive out, if you drive a two-wheeler, you will see I become younger every time I ride a motorcycle. Because if I drive… if I ride for four to five hours and come back, people say, Sadhguru, your beard has turned black, full black carbon <laughs> So, pollution. <laughs> So you gather material on your body, you wash it. Similarly, you're gathering other kinds of material upon your energetic system. You can wash this water with water, certain impurities will go with that. If you wash it with air, certain other things will go, but air is not always available like that. You can even notice this, if you… But these days, uh, these fans are going at a certain speed. But if you have the fan set at the right kind of speed, if you just sit under the fan for some time, you will see something within you lifts up. Have you noticed this? Little air wash. Similarly, there's a fire wash, which you're calling drishti. Is it necessarily happening because of other people's look or not? That's a questionable matter. But impact of life around you upon your energy system is definitely happening. If you have a spiritual process within you, that is you're doing some kriya or you're doing some meditative processes, then you don't need all this because you know how to wash yourself from within. If you do not have that, these things become significant. I must tell you this, there is a certain way to do which few generations ahead, people knew exactly how to do, but today I'm seeing they're just burning something and doing this, this, this. If you come to the yoga center, we are doing this kleshanasana kriya in a scientific manner, how it should happen. We have relieved people of various chronic ailments just by this fire wash. One surprise element that we found out recently is, we found that many children who are suffering with ADH, with learning disabilities, within a matter of six to eight weeks of this fire wash, they have changed dramatically. This we never expected. <laughs> so, your mother knowingly, unknowingly giving you a fire wash might have given you some learning ability. <laughs> okay. I'm bowing down to her. Mm. She did fire wash. Uh, same. Am I kudam? I kudam. Okay. <laughs> 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 In the middle of my body, conchum, body lunch bite extend out and Japan, but in Bakan actor and get a maximum of fight like Kadak is possible. That's true. That's our curly. So, uh, it is a casual doubt. Raguan and a Salmanch actor in the verse. Ragu? Raguan, bear right there, shall a popular actor. I put Leru. I know. Actually, said a pro prompting dialogue, very language like actually said a pro when he used to act in other languages. Uh, he for prompting, he used to give these spaces in between dialogue and dialogue where assistant director used to prompt him. So that became a style. The the spaces became a style, and uh, you know, it was very popular. At that. Sometimes, when I was seeing the videos, sometimes when there was someone complicated question, you start laughing. So, I I doubt if that's the prompting break. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Who, who is that person who is prompting in your head and how do you, in that little fraction of second, so well composed answer will come out, how is that possible? No. <laughs> no, it's not a prompting break. <laughs> I don't wish to insult people, but now that you asked, <laughs> you think this is a prompting break? No. <laughs> uh, what usually people think is very complex is usually the dumbest thing possible. What people think is very simple actually has a way to touch life. 
simple things that people ask has profoundness to it. Most profound things are very simple. This complication is coming because of their own mind, not because of life. So when they ask these stupid questions, which they think is intellectually complex, <laughs> I can't help laughing bad <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, about answering a question, I'm usually not answering a question, I'm always answering the person. Uh, they can say whatever they want, I'm not listening to them. Because people can say a lot of things. Shakuni, from Mahabharat, Shakuni. Shakuni said, God gave us humans' ability to speak, to hide what is in their mind. See, that crooked man <laughs> Not to express what's in their hearts, to hide what is in their heart, that is why God gave us ability to speak. Which is true, half the time we're most human beings. So, they're making up complexities because they think by being difficult, they become valuable. By being difficult, you don't become valuable. By becoming easy, you become valuable, isn't it? <clears throat> this has happened to everybody, but particularly to the uh, so-called spiritual people. You tell them anything simple, they will speak in a language that you cannot understand. First thing, this is the knockout. <laughs> the first knockout is, if you say something, I'll tell one sloka that you cannot understand <laughs> See, it's a way of totally knocking you out. I say something that you have no clue, you cannot figure this. Now I will go into a long philosophy about a simple question that you ask. So people are making a living by making simple things complex. My life is about making complex things simple. <laughs> because it is only by making things as simple as possible, it becomes accessible. If you… if a child is trying to pluck a mango from the mango tree, you are supposed to pull the branch down, not to lift it up and say, okay, pluck it, let me see, you'll grow taller. No, you are supposed to bring it down because the mango is not going to hang there forever, it's only for the season. Yes, life is not going to hang there forever, it's just a little bit small season you have of your own. Isn't it so? Don't think you are here forever. Before you and me came, countless number of smart people have been here, they're now they're all under this, buried somewhere. Isn't it so? So it's a brief amount of time. In this, should you see how to make things simple or should you look at how to make it complex? This is the nature of the intellect. An intellect will feel, if you're living just out of your intellect, it will feel stupid if it's simple. It wants complexity. So people who think they're intellectual always are making simple things extremely complex, unnecessarily complex. And then they're miserable, but they think that is also a virtue. If you're joyful, they think you're not intellectual. It must be like this <laughs> Really? Yeah. You must look like that. This also is needed. Uh -huh. Yeah, that will <laughs> definitely add. Needed. Otherwise, and you must also do… you must speak towards… <coughs> that is prompting time <laughs> I don't have any prompting time because I have no knowledge, I have no nothing. I just tried to be free of all the memory that I have. My body, what memory it carries, my genetics, what memory it carries, my experience of life, what memory it carries, I know how to keep it aside and simply look at things as they are. This means, in your home you have a mirror, being a star, even if you're natural, you still need a mirror, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> Many of them spend more time in front of the mirror yeah, than you. More than me, yeah, yes. definitely that's what… <laughs> so suppose your mirror remembered, let us say, even ten percent of what it has seen in its lifetime. If you went and stood in front of it today, what would it show you? Total mess. The value of the mirror is it has no memory. If it developed memory, gone. So this is… this is the value of your mind. If you know how to keep memory, the silo of memory aside and keep it, it's like a mirror, whatever it sees, it sees clearly, distinctly the way it is. Somebody likes it, somebody doesn't like it, it's their problem, that's their memory issue. Yeah, how does somebody like or dislike something? They've developed a certain memory. I like this, I don't like this, I belong to this, I don't belong to this. I don't belong to anything. I'm just looking at it as it is. Maybe in a given moment, you're not able to expose all dimensions of what it is, at least what is relevant for that moment. So, does your mirror need prompting time? Television needs time, tube light needs time. Mirror doesn't need time, so no prompting. ఒకరకంగా <laughs> 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 ఇక్కడ పెళ్ళయ్యి పిల్లలు ఉన్న వాళ్ళు ఎంతమంది ఉన్నారు చాలా మంది ఉన్నారు ఓకే ఓ అదే అందుకే క్వశ్చన్ అసలు యాక్చువల్గా సో ఈ క్వశ్చన్ ఇట్స్ అ ఫ్రమ్ అ పేరెంట్ టు అ పేరెంట్ మీ మీరు ఐ హ్యావ్ సీన్ ఫ్యూ వీడియోస్ వేర్ యూ స్పోక్ అబౌట్ యువర్ డాటర్ దిస్ ఈజ్ బీన్ అ బిగ్ డౌట్ యాజ్ అ ఫాదర్ ఫర్ మీ బికాస్ గ్రోయింగ్ అప్ మై ఫాదర్ వాజ్ వెరీ స్ట్రిక్ట్ దెన్ ఐ థాట్ ఐ హ్యావ్ టు బి వెరీ ఫ్రెండ్లీ విత్ మై సన్ లైక్ లైక్ అ ఫ్రెండ్ అండ్ దెన్ ఐ హ్యావ్ సీన్ few kids who are really spoiled because their parents have been really friendly and then i think little bit of koncham strict undalam so there is a lot of confusion what what do you think according to ante neeru obviously to each to their own but nee drushtilo what is the right way of parenting to be valaku full freedom a ledante koncham tough undala pillalto why should we think on these terms a child is not a… you must understand this. If a tiger is born, let's say, a tiger cub is born, ninety percent of what he needs for his life is within himself, only ten percent parenting. The tiger's parents, mother and father do just a little. Ninety percent is intrinsic, if he just eats well, he becomes a good tiger, this is all. But now you are born as a human being, your only ten percent is within you of being human. Ninety percent has to be nurtured. This is the significant thing about being human. Because the range of possibilities of how many varieties of human beings you can be within yourself is too many. That is not so for any other creature. They are born like that, nature has fixed it like that. Little variations, ten percent variation between one tiger and another tiger. If both of them eat well, they are about the same tigers, isn't it? So because of this, human parenting becomes an important aspect. So once you bear a child, it's a twenty-year project. That is if they do well. If they don't do well, it's a lifelong project <laughs> So you want them to do well so that you can be free, yes? Because you understand if, if they don't do well, they will sit on your lap for your rest of your life. No, no, they must go. So what do you have to give them? 
you don't have to teach them the tricks of the world, that they will learn. Some will learn easy, some will learn the hard way. It's okay, they must learn it their way. What you give them is what it means to be human being. This is all you give them. So for this, you must look at yourself. You don't have to do much with them. If a child arrives in your house, if your child is born in your home, you should not think you have to do something with the child. You must look at yourself because children don't listen to you. Whatever the nonsense you speak, they're not listening to you, just like me, they are. <laughs> I'm not listening to anybody, I just look at them and answer them <laughs> They're just looking at you, observing every little thing that you do, how you sit, how you stand, how you speak, what is the expression on your face. All this they're doing, you see how the child is looking? Yeah. Yeah. He's not listening to you, he's looking. So you must become in such a way that when he looks at you, he wants to be like you. So being… being a star in Andhra Pradesh, Telangana is fine, that's a profession. But you must become a star to a child. Child should think, my father is a star, not because you are popular in the world, but he sees you as the best human being that he can think of because there's not much exposure for him, there is a safety. Hmm. He's not seeing so many people, he's just seeing mother, father, a few people. Yes. Among the few people that he sees, he must look at you as you are the best man out here. <laughs> if he sees that… That's… that's what I'm working on something. <laughs> if he sees that, he will anyway go that way. If he doesn't see you that way, then he will look all over the place for some other kind of example. Yeah. Today, the examples that he sees are not necessarily at home or school or in the neighborhood. They are somewhere in another part of the world. They may not even exist. I'm saying they may not even exist, but they're influencing him. So especially if his screen time has to go down, you must be really a superstar at home. Tch, you understand? Everyone. <laughs> yes. It's not just for uh, him, for every one of you. This is the only way your child wants to be who you are. He looks at you and thinks, oh, my father, hmm, <laughs> this is not what I want to be. <laughs> then you try as hard as you want, he will do everything that you don't like just to freak you. <laughs> yes, you've done it. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Just to freak you, he will do something. Just in reaction, even if you're saying the best things, he's doing the opposite of it. Just in reaction. So this is very, very important. This is not about giving freedom, this is not about being strict. You just create an atmosphere where he's naturally looking up to you, he wants to be like you. In this, if you fix yourself, everything is fine, there's very little parenting to do. It's like, see, even the chicken, ducks, tigers, lions, all of them have done this. If they walk, see how the, all the little ones are walking behind, running behind them? Tch, they desperately want to be like their mother or father, have you seen this? Your children should become like that. For that, you need to work on yourself, not on them <laughs> Answer will win a manch question level with my confidence of them. <clears throat> so, Chinna um, Pudu, when I was a kid, um, when he very supposed to be popular astrologer came home, and then uh, he, he said, Yabbai ki Rajyoga ondi, and you know, so, first doubt Rajyoga, a topic I could only listen. 
But then as I grow, when I was watching this, uh, generally in the industry, outside, everywhere, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. Every time a politician or an actor or somebody in general also outside, <laughs> somebody dies and then they, they have such good things to talk about them. Everybody says he's a friend, he's such a good guy. And, and sometimes I keep wondering, I wish these guys came back into life and they heard all this and went back to die again. So, why is this happening? Because in everyone is a good person, 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 a good person. So, why, what is the reason? Chachipoyin vaadu idhanal tappu cheshna da, idhu varukkum. Huh? Chachipoyin vaadu idhanal tappu cheshna da. Chesin onlu unnaru, chala mandi. Valik kodu chala pogatthal chooshan. No, no, no. Chachipoyin tharavata? Ah. Leer. And the kid, what? Pogal. ఏదంటే మనం దేవాని తీరుకొస్తాడనే భయం తెలుగు దే నాట్ అండర్స్టాండ్ చాలా బాగా మాట్లాడారు కదా ఒకసారి ఆయన తెలుగుకి పీపుల్ అప్రిషియేట్ ద డెడ్ రైట్ ఫుల్లీ షో బికాస్ నో డెడ్ మ్యాన్ హెస్ ఎవర్ హార్మ్డ్ ఎనీబడి నో డెడ్ మ్యాన్ హెస్ డన్ ఎనీథింగ్ రాంగ్ ఎవర్ ఎక్సెప్ట్ దట్ ఈస్ మెల్స్ ఇఫ్ యూ డోంట్ ట్రీట్ హిమ్ వెల్ దట్స్ అ ఓన్లీ థింగ్ యూ హ్యావ్ టు హీ demands attention that you quickly dispose him, otherwise he will make your life miserable. <laughs> That's the only thing. Otherwise he's not done anything wrong. So people naturally praise a dead man. Having said that, it is also a civilizational aspect, a human aspect that it doesn't matter when you're alive, we may be running the same race, we may be fighting, we may be elbowing each other, struggling looking at all negativities at each other. But when mortality happens, when death happens, we keep all those differences aside and we bow down and say, whatever was good about you, they may talk about it, nothing wrong with that. It's… it's good. Everywhere in the world, no matter which culture it is, when somebody dies, very few people on the planet are so crude, they will also disrespect the dead body. They will kick it around, they will do horrible things to it, all this. Otherwise, most human beings on this planet, even if they fight war and they themselves kill them, once they die, they bow down. Because you bow down to mortal nature of who we are. We know he may be dead, I may be standing, but it's just a question of time. It's just a question of time. Apart from that, respecting the dead, is not necessarily exaggeration. In every human being, there are pluses and minuses. Because uh, both of you are running the same race, I highlighted your minuses all my life to put you down because I want to win the race. But I'm sorry, I don't want to use that word with you, somebody died. Now you talk about their pluses because pluses were also there. Yeah. We haven't spoken about it. We haven't spoken about it. If now also if you do not speak, even then you want to speak minuses, I think that will be very crude. At least when somebody is dead, if you have nothing plus to say, you become silent. Otherwise, the pluses that you did not say all these years, at least then you must say… I wish they said before, <laughs> but that doesn't that, happen. That yeah. is… So that is true. I wish they had said it all their life, that's a different matter. But life doesn't happen like that. Life is such that everything that you want, somebody else also wants. There are so many things, there are so many dynamics of life. Not everybody is living in that level of maturity. Even if what I want, somebody takes, I can be joyful and be here. Not everybody is made like that. So they highlighted the minuses because of the frictions. But once a person dies, this is not the time to talk minuses. You highlight the pluses, but there are fools who are just exaggerating everything, that's a different matter. But this is a basic human decency towards each other. Uh, growing up, I… Uh, 
never used to get to listen to this word depression much. Um, very, very rarely a word like a psychiatrist or a depression or something. Now that we are all aware of that and, and people know that it's a genuine uh, um, issue and we we'll talk a lot which is very good, I understand completely. But then I also realize there's so much of talk happening. Almost every alternative person, in some conversation we hear this depression word happening a lot nowadays. I'm happy that the awareness has become more, but again at the same time I'm also realizing there are a few people who suddenly might be feeling a little low on a particular day and they want to believe that it is depression. I, I know the depression is a very genuine serious problem, but because of this overexposure, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Is it really pushing the next generation into a, you know, thinking on any small hiccup also thinking that this might be something serious problem and they giving into it. Oh, I didn't know that was a popular question. <laughs> <laughs> With your question, you are getting into trouble. If I answer this, I will get into deeper trouble <laughs> I have already last one year, I have been in lot of trouble because a whole lot of people are pursuing me and saying, he doesn't respect depression, he is talking against it, he thinks it is not a medical no, issue. No, I respect it. By the way, I don't want to be in trouble. But I, gen I genuinely believe it and… but I just don't know it's… with… with few… It, it's just becoming too much. They are talking so much about it that sometimes, sometimes people who are generally low on a particular day also might feel… No, don't be… Ninety percent of the cases are maybe fair, but sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> he really <laughs> plays it safe <laughs> <laughs> It is not that I am not made like this, that if somebody is suffering, I'll mock them. That's the last thing I'll do in my life. But uh, these days, it's become an activism about everything, not just one aspect. So people are always looking for a cause in their life. Any one word, something, without even understanding what is the context of that one word, simply they'll go on. So let me tell you this. This depression issue came up, I just… it was a quote, a daily quote in which I said, whatever the nature of your ailment, physical, mental, essentially the source is within you. Either your body has turn, turned against you or your intelligence has turned against you. This is a fact. You can give it many names, you can call it stress, anxiety, depression, this, that. Something has turned against you. That is, something within yourself has turned against you. Some outside situations also may prompt you, push you in that direction. But fundamentally, if my intelligence was working for me, I would definitely keep myself in the best of… best possible way. If all the cells in my body were working for me, will I make myself sick? So this is all I said. A campaign ran for about six, eight months, all kinds of people commented, he doesn't know what he's talking, this, this. I have spoken to top-level people in this field across the world. All of them think what I'm saying is perfectly fine. Whether even if I don't get endorsements from them, I know it's perfectly fine because I know how my mind works. I know if I give myself the luxury, I can also become depressed, something doesn't work my way. Nothing actually works my way most of the time <laughs> Yes, I will tell you in more detail if you have time. Because when you do as many things as I do, so many things don't happen the way you want it. The reason why people have reduced their lives to very small scope is simply because they're afraid of failure. I know I will die a failure. But I'm a blissful failure, so it doesn't matter. My… <laughs> you know, in my life, it so happened. Almost thirty-eight years ago, I was sitting in one place, suddenly every cell in my body burst into ecstasy. Then I observed what is happening within me. Then I realized after a few weeks, if I don't mess with my mind, I'll burst with ecstasy. Then I thought, this is it, I have discovered something fantastic. 
On that day, the world's population was 5.6 billion people. Then I sat down and made a plan that in next two and a half years, I will make the entire world ecstatic. <laughs> hey, wait, wait, don't clap at my failures <laughs> Now it is thirty-eight years. <laughs> Ah, uh, we've touched a few million people, people say we have touched some five hundred, six hundred million people. But that's not my idea of the world. Now the population also has increased. I know I will die a failure, but I'm not a depressed failure, I'm a blissful failure <laughs> Now, why I'm saying this to you is, well, there are certain pathological issues within the system. There are genetic issues, there are this chemistry issues. But for all this, fundamentally, the basic control for all this is within you. You have not taken charge of it, that is a clear factor. You are trying to manage an inner situation by arranging an outer situation. But whoever the hell you are, you can never arrange the outer situation just the way you want it. Does it ever happen? Does it ever happen to anybody? Nobody happens hundred percent your way, isn't it? Not your husband, not your wife, not your parents, not your children, not your friends, not your office, nobody happens one hundred percent the way you want it. So if you are going to freak every time, when something doesn't happen the way you want it, then you will freak for the rest of your life. So if you see this, you would understand that the source of all human experiences within you, including how your chemistry will slosh, is within you. When somebody is ill, are we going to talk all this to them? No. They need care, they need help, they need medicine, they need compassion, that's a different matter. But those of you who are healthy, if you think, because right from childhood this comes, if you are sick, you get attention, if you are joyful, you will get scolding. This must change in the society. Joy should get attention, <laughs> misery should not get attention. This is a very misunderstood way of handling things. If a child is jumping with joy and screaming, Hey, why are you screaming? If you be, 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 like this means, mo 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 it's just a wrong way of raising a child because a child must understand he must invest in being well. He must not invest in being unwell. Unwell will not bring any results or rewards to him. He must understand this in a very deep way. If he thinks being unwell physically or mentally, I will get lot of attention and rewards, he will work towards being unwell. This may look very simplistic. But I'm telling you this from a very profound dimension of who we are. There is something called as life energy, as intelligence. Intelligence is not the bone box that you carry. If you… See, does your aukai look like you? Hello? Does it smell like you? Does it feel like you? No. If you mix only I have just chili and mango, and rise and eat it, it goes inside and becomes you, isn't it? There is an intelligence within you which can make this horribly spicy stuff into you. There's an intelligence or no? You eat a banana, it becomes you. When there is such a dimension of intelligence, from all kinds of nonsensical material that you give, it makes a human being. If you have access to this intelligence, your well-being, your health, your mental balance is in your hands or no? If you don't take charge of this, then you are thinking it is all happening to you. So a lot of people for ages, especially in the last hundred years, because of psychiatry developing in a certain way, people started saying, no, there is genetic things, you can't touch it. Well, now genetic sciences are telling you in twenty-four hours, you can change your genetic course completely if you do the right things with yourself. You can change the genetic patterns of who you are in a matter of twenty-four hours. I can show this to you. 
People who go through certain types of initiations and processes, twenty-four hours later you look at them, their very face will look different. You cannot recognize them, they will become like that because you can transcend your genetic limitation. In fact, this entire culture is about that. Spiritual process means that. See, when you are eighteen years of age, you don't want to be like your parents, I want to be something different, this, that. But you see the same person, by the time you're forty, forty-five, you begin to walk like your mother, talk like her, sit like her, stand like her. Have you noticed this happening to you? Because the genetics are taking over. We call this traditionally as karma. Karma means past memory is ruling the present. If memory rules the present, if your memory structures who you are, you have no life of your own, you're just an extension, you're a recycle, you're not a fresh life. Spiritual process means just this, that you want to break away from the limits of your memory because memory means there is evolutionary memory, there is atomic memory, there is elemental memory, there is genetic memory, conscious, unconscious, articulate, inarticulate, there are many kinds of memories. You want to transcend this so that you become a fresh life, your experience of life is completely fresh. Otherwise, you're just a recycle of the past. Why same problems e exist after hundred generations is simply because nobody breaks the memory cycle. There is these words which are all misunderstood today. There is something called a samsara. Samsara means, in Tamil it's become samsara means wife. Because she keeps them on the rope and keeps them run around. Samsara means cyclical movement. That is, everything that is physical in the existence is in a cyclical movement. You take an atom, it is doing this. You take the planets, it is doing this. You take the galaxy, it's doing this. You take the whole cosmos, it is doing this. Everything that's physical is in cyclical movement. So if your entire experience, particularly if your identity is completely rooted in your physicality, you will also be in a cyclical motion. If you want to break this, a dimension beyond physicality has to come into your experience. If you touch something beyond your physical nature, then we are saying this is spiritual. You went to temple, church, mosque, wherever, this is not spiritual. There you are going, what is the prayer about? What is the prayer about? Dear God, give me this, give me that, save me, protect me. Hello? This is just survival, outsourced. So if you want to break the cycle, then you have to touch a dimension which is not physical in nature. Once you touch something that is not physical in nature, there is no cyclical moment because you have become free from all the memory bank that you have. So whether you have chemical issues within you, whether you have pathological issues, genetic issues, you can break away from that. Maybe certain people will need more striving, Certain people will come out more easily, that is always there, but for everybody there is a way. So when I say all your ailments, if they are infections, they're different. They come from outside, it's an invasion, you have to deal with it. But rest of the things are manufactured within you, this is your cause. Fundamentally you have to see my physical health, my mental health is my responsibility, one hundred percent. If you see this, then methods are available to come out. We have all the compassion because I want you to understand, if you have a physical ailment, you will get compassion from everybody. If you have a mental ailment, you will get ridicule from everybody. So particularly people who are suffering any kind of mental ailments, depression, anxiety, whatever, they need double the compassion that physical ailments need. But normally in societies, they get ridicule because it is very difficult. It's very difficult to decide whether this person is really sick or making it up or they're acting it up to get something out of me or what it is you can't make out. One time it looks real, another time it looks like it's made up. So unfortunately, both for the one who is suffering and those who live around them, 
it is a constant struggle. But the most fundamental thing is, whoever you are, whatever condition you are, first and foremost thing to understand is, physical and mental health is my responsibility, hmm? It can go out of hand, it's always there. Whatever you do, we may die, whatever we do, we may become sick, that's a different matter. But it is our responsibility, if you see this, there is a way to touch the very source of creation which is throbbing within you. When the source of creation which made this entire complex body out of Aokai and Chintatokku, <laughs> when it can do this, it can also do some repair job, isn't it? Hello? One who manufactures the whole thing, can't he do some repair job? You have lost access to it. You think for everything there's a solution outside. Yes, when we need help, we will take help. When it, things have gone out of control, we seek help from outside. But fundamental thing is to take responsibility. Today, genetic sciences, neurosciences and also psychiatrists are beginning to speak that whatever the condition, it is possible to alter this from within. Only thing is how. There are many ways for how. Yoga is a technology. Yoga does not mean twisting and turning your body as most people are doing. It is a technology of taking charge of this. One thing is very clear, even if you go to the doctor, they're only giving you a pill, isn't it? What is a pill or a tablet? Just a certain amount of chemicals. If you put these chemicals, it lifts you out of your depression. It makes your anxiety go a little bit. It may not permanently go, at least for those few hours, it's down. So essentially, human experience has a chemical basis. Your joy is a certain kind of chemistry, your misery is a certain kind of chemistry, anxiety is one kind of chemistry, tranquility is another kind of chemistry, ecstasy is one kind of chemistry, agony is another kind of chemistry. All human experience has a chemical basis to it. This is the greatest chemical factory on the planet, most complex and sophisticated chemical factory on the planet. The question is only, are you a great CEO or a lousy CEO? That's all the question is. That may sound brutal when you're sick. When you're sick, there is compassion. But when you're well, you must take responsibility for this. Otherwise, you will make yourself sick. Everybody has an excuse as to why I should not get up from my bed and cry in my bed. Everybody has some reason, isn't it? Hello? Yes or no? Everybody has some pain somewhere about something. Somebody died, somebody did not… If somebody is born, somebody is not born, all kinds of things. There is no human being who doesn't have a reason to push themselves into some kind of mental dip. Everybody has or not, there is a reason. Some people get there, some people don't get there. Is it always intentional? No. But there is an inner intent, that intent may not be a conscious intent, there is a chemical intent, there is genetic intent. Your uh, atte was depressed, now you don't know why, you are fine and suddenly you're depressed because there is a genetic intent. But this intent can be altered if you take charge of yourself. You would have uh, um, heard about this word, uh, deja vu. Nendra could unbeach it together. Apra put a yellow choose now, it is in the moon good, I in the ilage jargin there and this day. So I always uh, strongly. Cinema la jargin, are they seen chupisara? Adi, it's called some loop effect. There are some four or five films made which keeps repeating itself. But in life, I felt strongly few times. I know it's not possible, but I saw something and I thought exactly ide ilage in the mundi jarigin. What do you think is the bad direction and yeah, they see no sunday. Your director Devada It's just some one china glitch, problem on mind low than take on a then call a backstory on that. There are many dimensions to it, but 
One thing is most people are afraid of anything that's unfamiliar. They have a fear of unfamiliar. So, they have set up a mechanism within themselves, they're looking for the familiar. Either they will do what you said just now, I have seen this somewhere, otherwise they'll look some… look at somebody and say, Oh, she looks just like my sister. She doesn't look like your sister <laughs> But, you know, just the same two eyes, one nose, one mouth, <laughs> just like her. <laughs> Like this they will find reasons because they're looking for something familiar. This usually happens to people when they're in that phase of their life, when they're not able to figure out what is happening with their life or they're in a new space where they don't know anything about it, suddenly they will invent things that from somewhere else, this person looks like my grandfather, that person looks my like my uncle, this person like this. Oh, this tree, I have seen it somewhere. Even that same damn tree never looked the way it looked on that day, I want you to know. Mm. Hello? Even that tree, yeah. if you have seen it earlier, it won't be the same. Day to day it is changing, isn't it? Day to day everybody is changing or not? Hmm? So, but is it possible that somebody can revisit something? They can, but ninety-nine percent of the time, it is not so. They're looking for something familiar. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. So, uh, audience, everyone, have question. Sadgalan kunte. Na chala question lo nae me a chance. So, uh, the mic. selection process is you have to the mic? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Namaskar, I'm Sadhguru. Uh, so, I'm not sure if you have heard of the uh, TV series called Sacred Games. It's very famous or unfamous. Uh, it is a lot of uh, sexual and violence content in it. So, what do you think uh, art and entertainment should be given that much space? or it is disturbing to know that uh, uh, TV series like these are very famous and popular in today's generation. If I understand the question right, you're asking why something that depicts so much uh, violence and sexuality, why is it popular or why should we allow it to happen, is it the question? Yeah, or it should be allowed in art as in it's okay to be there. <sighs> See, the dangers of this, even addressing this question is... <laughs> now, if you address this question, immediately some people think their own ideas of what's right and wrong can be imposed on other people, which will not work. In a free society, it will not work. At the same time, is violence, extreme violence in movies and very gross ways of… Uh, usually sexuality means generally a woman is being treated in a… not necessarily a nice way. I remember in the seventies there were movies, Hindi movies, I did not see most of them, but people used to tell me that there were some actors who were called rape specialists. Hindi, yeah, in Hindi. So in every movie, there has to be one rape. It became almost like a standard for some time. So all those people who saw those movies as children, because there was no uh, adult certification for that, anybody could go and watch it. They thought this is the way to treat a woman. Now when rape happens in the street, why are you surprised, I'm asking? We have cultivated them. All said and done, the cinema may be a commercial enterprise, but it has a profound impact in a society like this. See, in certain other countries, 
people watch the movie, go home, forget about it. Here it's not like that, we even elect them. Because a cinema is not a cinema, cinema is more than reality in this country. So when it is like that, I think it should be conducted more responsibly. What is it that we are trying to create? If you try to control it from outside, it'll become ugly. If people use just about anything and everything to make money at the cost of the society, that is definitely ugly. So, I don't know what this television serial is because I never get the time to look at that place. Whatever it is, I don't know in what context. See, there is violence in the society, you don't have to hide it, you can show it. There is sexuality in the society, you don't have to hide it, you can show it. But are you glorifying it or are you showing it in a way that people say this is not the way? You showed a rape because it's happened. When people see it, they must say, this is not the way. If they think, wow, this is the way, then what kind of society are you creating? <laughs> so, many times this has come to me in various different forms, this kind of question. I think people are hiding behind art. I'm sorry if I, if I say anything no. wrong. People are hiding behind the term art. If it is art, it should not be so commercial. You're doing commerce and you're calling it art. There may be some artistry involved in it, we appreciate that. But there was a time when we were growing up, there were art movies and there were commercial movies. Now there is no such thing, commercial movies are art. So commercial movies are made essentially to make money. Somebody is investing to make money, nothing wrong with commerce because nothing wrong with commerce, nation's commerce has to develop in all levels. So entertainment is also commerce, it's fine. If it is commerce, then it must be controlled, there must be proper… For every commerce, there is a, a certain amount of control, isn't it, in a society? In this society, though today everybody, at least a lot of… a big percentage of population is drinking, still we are holding on to it that you cannot adv advertise alcohol. They will show an alco bot alcohol bottle and say CDs and music. Yes or no? Sparkle water. Sparkling water. That is okay, but CD and CD music, and how does it come, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I'm saying when we see it is going to influence the society in a big way, there are controls. So, if… if something is going to impact the society, there must be some sort of control. It is best the self-control is self-imposed rather than a government agency imposing it because then it'll become something else, very ugly it'll become somebody who doesn't know anything about it. It is not about deciding what people should see and should not see. It is about where do we want to drive the society. Right now, more than… I don't know about this television serial, I'm continuously speaking about all the… what are these… Uh, video games. A five-year-old child enjoys shooting people, that's the only thing he plays. He enjoys shooting people, shooting people, shooting people. On the screen, it's quite good because it doesn't spill blood anywhere, it's okay. There it spills, but it's okay. Now when he becomes eighteen, doesn't he want to get a little real? Hello? In United States, the school shootings are happening. People think it's an American phenomenon. No, no, no. If there were guns in Indian homes, it will happen. Hello? You think it won't happen? 
In America, in every home, there is more than one weapon, all right? In almost every home, there is more than one weapon, minimum. There is at least a shotgun and a handgun, for sure. And we have toy guns. Not that, I'm saying yeah. real… real firearms. Real, yeah. So there is excess, so it is only happening in America. But if there were weapons in Indian homes, even here kids would be shooting each other, for sure. When, when emotions fire up, you want to shoot, isn't it? So from the age of four, five, if you're practicing how to shoot people, when you become sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, don't you want to get real? Don't you want to see some real blood? I don't see what's wrong. If you're cultivating your children to do this on the screen continuously, what is the problem for you if he gets real or if his friend gets real and he shoots your ch child, what is the problem I'm asking? Because you must understand, certain actions have certain consequences. This must be handled responsibly by people who are creating those things. If you bring loss for everything, then society becomes ugly. Government cannot manage these things, people should manage these things. So if somebody makes such a thing, people should not go and watch it. But no, they all want to go and see. So somewhere they enjoy it, isn't it? Today you see any of the Hollywood movies, it's not like before. Before also they were shooting, but now it comes, the bullet enters and the brains splash and there is a rerun. Again it comes in slow motion and splashes all over the place. People are enjoying it. Once you enjoy these things, then violence is inevitable on the street. It's just a question of graduation, isn't it? So, what kind of society we want to create? All those people who influence the society in a big way, whether artists, politicians, media people, spiritual leaders, religious leaders, whoever has influence over people, they must look into themselves and see what is the consequence of our actions. This much responsibility must come. Sadhguru? Ooh, yeah. Ooh. How did you grab the microphone? Yeah. I have a question. I have a question. Uh, my previous generation, my fathers are a farmers, but they made me an engineer because they couldn't able to survive from their land. So the complete generation of my five fathers has converted to engineers or some other works. Oh. So entire farming is vanished there. I'm interested to do farming, but because of the survival problem, I came to an engineering. So how have to overcome this process? Okay. Anyway, <laughs> we would… Uh, we would like uh, to have a well-studied engineer, not an engineer who's converted. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> How do you get converted to engineering? Anyway, I understand what you're saying. See, this is a major tragedy unfolding in the country. Out of 160 million hectares of arable land in this country, one hundred and four million hectares of land, the soil is right now labeled as distressed. That means nearly sixty percent of our soil is moving towards becoming uncultivable in a matter of anywhere between fifteen to forty years' time. In forty years' time, the fertile lands that you have seen will turn into uncultivable land maximum forty years' time, anywhere between now to then. How does this happen? If you want the soil to be rich, before we go into that, I want you to first understand, what is sitting here as you and me is just the soil that you walk upon, it's just a piece of the planet. 
If the soil is weak, the foot becomes weak. The foot is weak, our very genetics become weak. There's substantial studies about this. So if… why is the soil become weak? Why such a phenomena is happening in this country? The only way you can put back organic content into the soil is by the leaves of the trees and the animal waste. Trees are gone long time ago, just to tell you to what extent. In the Ganga Basin, which accounts for twenty-five percent of India's geography and thirty-three percent of India's agriculture, we have removed ninety-two percent of green cover in the last fifty years, ninety-two percent. What is our plan for this land? In Kaveri Basin, which is some eighty-three thousand square kilometers, right now we're running a campaign called Kaveri Calling. All of you must be a part of it one way or the other. In Kaveri, in the last fifty years, we have removed eighty-seven percent of the green cover. So no leaves, no trees, no leaves, animals are all traveling abroad. How will you enrich the soil? The food that you're eating is just the soil. You ate it up, what did you put back? Nothing. By throwing chemicals, you think it'll happen? Pretentious agriculture is happening. If we don't change this, whatever other aspirations we have, everything will fail. Doesn't matter what business, industry, what you develop, we'll have serious issues. People think water is the issue, water is not the issue, soil is the issue. If soil is rich, there will be enough water. The reason why agriculture is suffering is, this is one aspect. The other reason is, why at the time of independence, over ninety-two percent of Indian population was in agriculture? If you look back and see, two hundred and fifty years ago, we were the largest economy on the planet. We were the biggest exporters, thirty-three percent of the world's export came from India two hundred and fifty years ago. So what were we exporting? Were we exporting rice? No. Were we exporting agricultural produce? No. What were we exporting? We were exporting largely spices, more than that textiles. Andhra Pradesh, every district has a weave of its own, yes? Textiles was the main thing. Between 1800 and 1860, when the English decided to destroy the textiles of this nation, systematically they went about destroying it. From 1800 to 1860, our exports came down by ninety-six percent. So that doesn't happen just like that. That was done as a systematic process. So when this destruction of industry happened, Millions of people died in those sixty years, where one of the British governor-generals writes back saying, the fields of India are bleached with the bones of the weavers, millions. It is estimated over three and a half million to four million people died in those sixty years out of starvation. The rest desperately went about doing some kind of subsistence agriculture. Subsistence agriculture means I have a piece of land, I will grow little rice, little dal, little this, little that, everything that I need for a fi family, I will scratch the land and grow. This sort of agriculture happened. This is why ninety-two percent or ninety-six… ninety-two percent were in agriculture. Today this number has come down to sixty-five percent, thanks to you, you became converted engineer. Sixty-five to seventy percent are still in agriculture. What this means is, for ten people to eat, we want ten people to eat, but now seven of them are cooking. You think this is a good use of people? Ten people want to eat, very efficient, one person can cook, don't want two or three people can cook. Seven people cooking for ten people is not a wise way to do things, but that's where we are right now. Still seven people are cooking for ten people. So, you and more people must become engineers, it is good or whatever else they have to become. But at the same time, 
can you let the agriculture die? Because today, if you make a survey, we have made some surveys, not official surveys, but generally we've just asked around. If you ask around, how many farmers want their children to go back to farming? Less than two percent. This means in another twenty, twenty-five years when this generation passes, we will not know how to grow food. You may think the farmer looks illiterate, he's not dressed like you, he doesn't look like you, he looks like no good, but I'll do one thing for you. You are from the farming family, those of you for two generations who lived in city, you have MBA, you have… You even if you have agricultural uh, MSc, you come, I'll give you ten acres, fertile land. Five different crops you grow it by yourself without taking local help. You will see you can't do it because this intrinsic knowledge that our farmer has, this is one of the most fantastic things that India has done is of the many things, well, we've gone to the… we are going to the moon, we've gone to Mangalyan, all kinds of things, businesses have done great things, science has done many things, but the most fantastic thing is, without any science of any modern science, without any new technology, just with traditional knowledge, our farmers have fed one billion people. This is not a small thing. So this transition from farming to other things should not happen out of desperation, should happen as a good plan to do. Right now, one reason why farming is not succeeding is, soil is weak, so water is scarce. Another thing is, scale is too small to make it successful. The average land holding is one hectare, that means two and a quarter acres per family is what we have. At this level of holding, whatever you do is going to be waste. Everybody is under loan, okay? Some… some seventy-eight percent of Tamil Nadu's farmers are under debt. Because… I, I'll just tell you an example. A young farmer in our region, it's very fertile region. He has three and a half acres, so I meet him and ask him, what are you doing for your water? What's your water source? He says he has put nine bore wells. In three and a half acres, he's put nine bore wells. Because there are bore well companies which will come and promise, if you put it here, more water will come, if you put it there, more water will come. Everybody is hitting bore wells and bore wells. In three and a half acres, maybe there is one or two sources or maybe there is no source of water. Because the scale is so small, Everybody is putting a fence, everybody has a bore well, everybody has an electric connection. This is not going to work. We need the scale, otherwise it will not work. Does it mean to say we have to take their land? No, for this we have worked out a system. I don't want to go into all the details in this, but this is what Rally for Rivers was about, how to integrate irrigation and marketing for the farmer so that his life can change. Now. One more big thing is, see India, the latitudinal spread that you have from Kanyakumari to Himalayas, twelve months of the year you can crop. There are very few nations where you can grow crops twelve months of the year. From Kanyakumari to Himalayas you can grow literally almost anything you want in the world. If we handle this land right, we can provide food for the entire world. It's possible to do that. And this is the only nation, this is the only nation where sixty-five to seventy percent of the population knows how to do this magic of transforming mud into food. It is not a small thing. We could use that knowledge, we could use that capability or we could make them destitute and come to cities and live in slums without any dignity, without any life to live, without any productivity. Getting into crime, you become an engineer, I'm glad. Many farmers' children join crime or other kinds of things because they have no other option. So this needs to be addressed. So one of the things is, we have converted literally over 69,670 farmers in Tamil Nadu. 
from regular farming to what is called as agroforestry, their incomes have gone up five to ten times in a matter of eight to ten years. <laughs> this is what… this is what we are calling as the Kaveri calling for the Kaveri belt… Uh, Kaveri uh, basin area. Because if you do this, we want to convert one-third of the Kaveri basin into agroforestry. If you do this, the forty-six percent depletion that's happened in the river waters will come back. River will flow once again, farmers will be rich and well-to-do, all this debt that is there in the banks will not happen because farmer will be rich by his own resource. This has to be done in a planned way, we must execute this, otherwise uh, this nation is not… is sitting on too many problems and soon too many possibilities also. But to convert problems into possibilities, every citizen has to stand up and do what needs to be done. Uh, namaskaram Sadhguru. Where are you? Uh, Sadhguru here. Okay. Uh, when a movie is made, uh, the idea and the story is… The question is for him <laughs> No, Sadhguru, it's to you. Uh, the idea and the story is developed um, to make it more popular on commercial factors. It developed on commercial factors to make it more popular to reach more number of people. Uh, can we use cinema to spread the spiritual methods uh, to large number of people through commercial and popular ways? Can you give uh, some uh, direction towards it? <laughs> <laughs> to spread the spiritual methods, yes. Yeah. I mean, how do we use cinema to take the spiritual methods more to the… Uh, and to more… make it more popular? collection <laughs> But then reach entry, then go impatience on that. Nizanga general look all the under travel and there. But cinema talk, Kadala which a palan put na da. Yeah. Huh? Yes. Aaj chey chhu, we can incorporate. Chala chala manch michalo, apne apne durus thunda cinema lagi. Koi sir kudar. Sadhguru, can can you give some direction on this? Meere wal. He is he is the director. He is the actor. Okay. Anyway. See, uh, cinema means you're thinking in terms of the big screen. Well, it's not that it's not a possibility. Uh, the question is, who will go and watch it? <laughs> it? It has to be commercially successful. Commercial success means people watched it, all right? This happened. This is about nine, nine, ten years ago maybe now. I was in United States and I was talking to somebody who's some kind of an expert on uh, uh, internet affairs. So I never get to go on the net and browse this and that, I never have the time to do those things. So I asked him, what are people looking for? Everybody is looking at their screen, what are they looking for? Very casually, very, very casually, as a matter of fact, he said, uh, Sadhguru, about seventy percent of the data is pornography. I said, what? He said, yes. I said, I don't want to believe this kind of nonsense. Seventy percent, is it pornography? It's not possible. Then I checked with a few other people, they all say, yeah, it's around that much, maybe sixty-five, seventy, something. And uh, what else are they using this for? There are many other things, drug sales, arms sales, all kinds. More than anything, what really kind of brought disgust to me was 1.6 million children below fifteen years of age are sold on the internet every year. When we sell our children, as human beings, we've hit the bottom. There's no further down to go, huh? When we start selling our children to be used, in all kinds of slavery, this means we've hit the very bottom, there's no further place to go, isn't it? That is when I decided, 
then let me get on the net. So in the last ten years, we've run a campaign that many of you in the upper regions might have suffered this, even if you're watching pornography in between Sadhguru appears <laughs> in an engineering. <laughs> I'm saying this with some glee <laughs> because when such a phenomenal technology is available to us, is this what we do? See, many great beings have come on this planet, but when they came, if they spoke, hardly ten people heard. In the ten people, all kinds of things. Today is the first time you can sit here and talk to the entire world. When there is such a tool in our hands, if we don't transform humanity now, that means we have no intention at all, isn't it? So your question is very relevant, but will our natural star make a movie on spirituality? Biopic Sadhguru <laughs> Last cinema lo na akar shot lo, I am guest appearance ala pass hotar frame. Okay na? So it it definitely every medium that we have, not necessarily a spiritual process, every medium that we have of communication must be used to transform human beings because that's the only problem that you have on this planet, human beings. There is no other problem. Hello? <laughs> yes or no? That's the only problem. So when there is such a powerful means of communication today, technology is available to touch every human being in whichever part of the world he or she is living. When this possibility is there, this is the time to transform humanity. Namaskaram Sadhguru, here Sadhguru, in the front, to your left. Namaskaram. Uh, Sadhguru, I would like to know how realized beings, only some of them become gods and others don't. Is there any science behind it or do they come with uh, any predetermined… Uh, no, they just life? have to die. For example, after Gautama, uh, so many would have come, but I think only you are doing such phenomenal things on this planet. What are you trying to tell me? I'm saying only you, <laughs> you are likely to be the next god, but then uh, already you are a god now. But, oh. but I'm saying why only you? For example, in these thirty years, so many disciples, so many people you have cultivated, would you make one of them as capable as you? In the days to come, in the years to come, can we see one of your disciples as Sadhguru? Oh. <laughs> Gautama became a Buddha, did not become a god. Buddha means one who is a dada over his buddhi. One is… one who has total mastery over his buddhi is a buddha. One who has no mastery over his buddhi is a monkey, compulsive, so many things. Tell me, what is it human beings are suffering? Their own intelligence, isn't it? If you take away half their brain, they will sit peacefully. So they don't know how to handle their own intelligence, that's all they are. So in this, where does God come from? You must understand, this is a godless culture. Please listen to me carefully. This is a godless culture. There is no the God in this culture ever. This is a culture where we always told you, your life is your karma. Did we or not? Huh? What does it mean? Karma means action. When you say, my life is my karma, 
it means you are saying, my life is my making, whether I'm making it unconsciously or consciously. This is not a culture to look up, this is a culture to look in. This is not a culture where you want to go and sit in God's lap. Here this is a culture which does not value God more than freedom because mukti was our highest goal, moksha was our highest goal, not God, isn't it? Now imported ideas you've got, see they all know what is God, what is heaven, the geography of heaven, they know the entire details. In this culture, we still don't know who we are. We are asking, who am I? This is the most profound question <laughs> The best thing about being a Hindu is, you're confused. <laughs> yes, it's very good because this is a geographical identity, this is not a religious identity which builds you confidence. I know this, God is with me, there's no such thing here. You don't even know who you are, so you're a natural seeker. Once you don't know, once you realize you do not know, we can try an experiment with you. Suppose I ask you to walk from there to there now, you will walk, very self-conscious, what… how others are looking at you, this, that. Walk like this. Suppose we turn off the lights and make it pitch dark. Now I ask you to walk from there to there, you will become super alert, isn't it? Hello? The moment you don't know what is the next step, do you become super alert or no? Some of you who do not know how to be alert will start imagining things and create fear. Otherwise, it's natural to become super alert, isn't it? So this is what it means, this is called as the intelligence of ignorance. If you identify yourself with your knowledge, which is all rubbish, whatever knowledge you have, if you identify with your knowledge, even if you know the libraries of this world, Still compared to this cosmic space, your knowledge is minuscule, isn't it? Huh? Is it minuscule or no? You may have ten PhDs, still what you know is a minuscule. If you identify with a minuscule, you become a minuscule. But our ignorance is boundless. Hello? Our ignorance is limitless, isn't it? If you identify with your ignorance, you're limitless. Once you identify with your ignorance, your intelligence will never sleep. Even if your body sleeps, your intelligence is always awake, standing. Then we say you're awakened. So, in this culture, because it's a godless culture, when we find a human being who who is accomplished in a way that you ca cannot believe a human being can do these things, then we say he is a deva or he is a deity. So we say somebody is awakened because he is able to see and do things that you are not able to do. You naturally look up to him, so we make him like a deity. This… the word God comes from outside. We don't have a word for God, please see this. We call it a murti, we call it a yantra, we call it by different names. It's very appropriate in this culture, people are referring to Tendulkar as cricketing god. It's not wrong. When we find somebody is accomplishing something that seems above what is human capability, what we think is human capability, then we look up to him as an accomplished being. There are words for this, but now because we've gotten into Western ways and we're speaking an English language, we're using the word God. Otherwise, we called him a Mahatma, we called him a Mahanubhava, you know, these kind of words just to say it is an extraordinary being. 
And that extraordinary being became the aspiration of every everybody else in that society. Out of our love, out of our respect, we may put some flowers, we may do something, but you must understand, we are aspiring to be like him. We are not there to go and sit on his lap in heaven. This is not the aspiration in this culture. Always the aspiration is this, you must understand, this is something that's all gone crazy now. There is no worship here, there is no prayer here, there is only darshan. Darshan means you behold a form which you think is higher than you and you want to take it into your heart, make that a part of yourself. That is what darshan means. You go to temple not to pray, darshan, just to see. Nothing need to happen, nothing to talk, nothing to tell him, no appeal, just to see. But because we've gotten so westernized, we're doing all that. Because they're saying, they're talking to their God and their God is talking to them. Now we also pretending he's also talking to us, we don't want to be left out <laughs> No, you are supposed to just behold, that's all, darshan is the only thing you do, no prayer. So, this is a hutchpatch thing, so you're saying this, Gautama did not become a god, people are aspiring to become a Buddha. So you think all the people around me are such dumb idiots, nobody is working to become whatever they see as Sadhguru. You think nobody is working? They are. There are… because we are touching millions of people, nearing a billion now, because of this, uh, some people just watching YouTube and they think they're doing well. Some people are on daily court and they think they're doing well. Some people have done inner engineering and they think something is happening. So what is the difference between an established process? Actually something that you have to do with yourself like inner engineering or further programs and just watching talks or even being here is, one is titillation, another is transformation. Titillation means you know what? It's entertainment, spiritual entertainment. Little, maybe the way you think and feel you change a little bit. This is not transformation, this is a little change. It may help you, I'm not saying it doesn't help, it helps. But there is no transformation. Transformation means you as an individual is a form. This form should transform. If that has to happen, something more profound has to be done. We are seeing, we are looking for sponsors and other things. If it comes through in the next few months, we may roll out inner engineering programs free of cost. <laughs> People, People are telling me, Sadhguru, you will have to file for bank bankruptcy. Uh, such a thing will not happen. I'm sure people have enough sense when they see some value, they will respond in their own way and contribute in their own way to keep it going for others. So, we will make it like this. For you, it is free. If you want another person to take it, pay something for the cost. One last question. Namaskaram Sadhguru. So, so we have an Indian tradition of like going to priest for a baby's name. So, and also when people start believing in some other religion, they change their name. So, I have this question that uh, has a person's name, like uh, does a person's name have an influence on what he becomes. Uh, it depends who that person is. It is just that when we name our children, we want to name something pleasant or inspiring. The official name we want it to be inspiring, 
the pet name at home, we want it to be pleasant and sweet. This is a natural thing. Why we want it to be inspiring is, when we utter, anybody who utters his or her name should feel something. Because your name has not only impact on you, it has impact on others because they are the people who say the name most of the time, not you. You don't go on chanting your name, it's the other people who say the name. So it must have a good impact on them when they utter the name. There is something called a sound. There is sound? Hello? The existence has sound. Words are created by us. When I say a word, when you give a meaning to a sound, it becomes a word. If I say boom, if you give a meaning to that, it becomes a word, isn't it? But boom is just a sound. So sound exists. Today modern science is telling you, everything in the universe, including your body, the planet, the solar system, the galaxies, everything, if you look profoundly enough, there is no physical matter, it is just a reverberation, vibration. Where there is a vibration, there is bound to be a sound. The question is only, is it within your hearing range or not? Some sounds are in your hearing range, rest are not in your hearing range. Otherwise, this whole creation right now is making a humongous amount of sound. You don't hear it because your hearing range is within a certain frequency band. So, every sound that you utter has a reverberation. A reverberation can either have a positive impact or a negative impact. So, in this culture we looked very profoundly and looked at what kind of sounds you must utter for your child. But today you're calling them cuckoo, bobo, momo, nani <laughs> I didn't realize that <laughs> So cuckoo, bobo, nani, at home, at home it's nice. But now that he's at home everywhere in the world, everybody calls him nani <laughs> That's a different matter, but the idea of giving profound names is, it is for the sound structure of that name. When you utter that sound, there must be a reverberation which enhances who I am. And also for the people who utter that, all kinds of very… Uh, for uh, a foreign tongue, very difficult sounding names, but profound impact. So sound and reverberations have impact. If there is somebody who is conscious, even today, I think I'm giving names for thousands of children every day. Depending upon the time, date and their birth and looking at their picture, we give a certain kind of name which fits the child, somewhere close around that. So this, different people were doing at different times, but everything, everything, this, there is distortion about everything there's a distortion. Now, before the child is born, they've chosen the name because something else, they want to call him Johnny Walker because they like the drink <laughs> <laughs> So, times are changing, but the existence has not changed. Only the social times are changing. Existentially, nothing has changed. Reverberations are reverberations. What has impact on you, has impact on you. Positive impact, negative impact is there in the world. Is it a deciding factor? No. You can have any kind of name and still live well. But we are trying to use every kind of support that we have, why not? Hmm? Every little support becomes valuable when difficult times come, isn't it? If your name is Shiva, every day, we have to utter the name Shiva, Shiva, Shiva. Even if we are not thinking of that one, just looking at you, we are saying Shiva. Even our dogs were named like this. Only today, because of the English people, lot of people think in every family I see, it's just crazy. They have all Indian names, but the dogs have always foreign names. <laughs> this is because 
this whole having a dog as a pet came from the English people because they were feeling lonely away from their homes. They loved their dog, cuckoo, bobo, mo 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 mo, all that. We had dogs, uh, cows, uh, animals in the house. I have one, what is it? It's a, his, his name is Subramanyam. <laughs> it's a beagle, Subbu. I did a film called Every Day Subramanyam, so we named him Subramanyam. Subramanyam is a good name for that. <laughs> <laughs> so we named everything like that because we have to utter it every day, one way or the other. We somehow utter sounds which are beneficial to us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, because this question, agriculture, was asked and uh, there is a concern everywhere. Chennai has gone dry. Next they're saying Bangalore will go dry, Hyderabad is standing in the queue. I want all of you who are here today, if you are a concerned citizen of this country, in some way please participate in Kaveri Calling. We will give out a call how to participate. There will be… this is a more action-oriented thing than Rally for Rivers, because here we want to plan to… to make one-third of Kaveri Basin green once again. We need to plant 242 crore trees. This is not like… This is not like we are going to go and physically plant everything. This will be done on farmer's land by them, but we have to support it. So we are looking at raising super large nurseries. Right now, we have over twenty-four nurseries across Tamil Nadu. Now we are seeing how to build these nurseries in Karnataka also. So there is room where we will start a campaign, at least plant one tree for each one of you. If you're four, four people in the family, plant four trees, uh, it will be a minimum amount of just raising the nursery kind of cost, not a very big cost. So, you don't have to plant just one. Hmm? And you may have a tree to sit under like Gautama, the Buddha, it may work. <laughs> Thank you very much. Concluding… Uh, if you want to say something, please. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, I just told few of my friends that I'm going to meet uh, Sadhguru, Sadhguru. So I thought they will uh, tell me to take blessings or, you know, they'll tell me questions what to ask. But you know what they said? They said, give him a hug, man, they said. You are cool, Sadhguru. <laughs> this, <laughs> <a, laughs> this is a trick. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's a trick. No, it is not a trick. <laughs> <laughs>